قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this new episode of Ask Zad coming to you Sunday, inshallah, every Sunday at 4 o'clock Mecca time. Uh, Maryam says, whom does Allah guide and whom does he lead astray? Is this something in our hands or is it only Allah who can decide this and the servants have no role in this whatsoever. So Maryam is asking about predestiny. She's asking about Al-Qadr. And the belief in Al-Qadr, Khayruhu wa Sharruhu, is a very important thing in a Muslim's belief because without it, he's not a Muslim. There are six pillars of Iman. وَأَن تُؤْمِنَ بِالْقَدَرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ To believe in the predestiny, whether it's good or bad. So what Maryam is asking, do we have a role in whatever is happening? Or are we just simply like a leaf in the wind, tossing us wherever it wants. This is something that Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah firmly believe in. One, that Allah Azza wa Jal is the creator of everything, which includes our own deeds. So what I'm doing now, what I am acting, what I am holding, what I am fixing, what I am watching, all of these are my actions, but were created by Allah Azza wa Jal, as there is no other creator except Him. So when I m make Umrah and go around the Kaaba, these actions are created by Allah, and I'm doing them. And if someone steals or kills another, he could not have done that without Allah Azza wa Jal creating that. So we believe that Allah is the creator of everything. We believe that Allah Azza wa Jal knows everything. So the knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jal is unlike anything we can think of. Allah is not like us. There is nothing like unto him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you come to think of power, when you come to think of his hearing and seeing, when you come to think of his beautiful attributes, nothing is similar to him subhanahu wa ta'ala, including knowledge. And as Imam Ahmad interpreted, and, and all the Salaf, when they were asked about what is predestiny, what is Qadr, they said it is Allah's knowledge. So Allah knows what was in the past, what is happening now, what will happen in the future, and what will not happen, how would have it been materialized if it were to, be ha to, to take place. Also, we believe in Allah Azza wa Jal willing what is happening. And there are two types of divine will. The things that Allah tells us that he loves and he tells us that he doesn't love. So he wills and he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, tells us that he loves people to worship him. And he hates people when they disbelieve in him. Yet, he gave us the free will to choose. So if we choose this, then this is what complies with Allah's divine legislative will, and we believe and we do what Allah loves.
But if we choose otherwise, this goes with the universal divine will of Allah Azza wa Jal, which whatever he loves or does not love may not impact it. It's going to happen. Why? He could have changed it. Yes, he could have. But he willed not to change it. He gave you the free will to choose and you chose that. This is what he also wills over you. And Allah says in Surah at takwir For whoever wills among you to take a right course, which means that Allah is giving us the right to choose. For whoever wills among you to take the right course, and you do not will except that Allah wills, Lord of the worlds. So your will and mine is related to Allah's will. We cannot make a will unless it complies with Allah's will. So we have Allah's knowledge. We have Allah's uh, um, uh, creation of our deeds. We have Allah's will, div uh, uh, um, divine will. And we have also the fact that Allah has written everything that is going to happen till the day of judgment. 50,000 years before Allah created the creation. So everything was created, every, everything was written, and Allah knows exactly what's going to happen, nothing going to change. So now I can ask, okay, then why am I doing this? Why am I worshiping Allah if it's already predetermined, predestined that I will go to hell? The question is, how do you know what was or what is predestined for you? How do I know that I won't make a million Kuwaiti dinar next week in a business transaction? Because if I think like you do in worldly matters, tomorrow there is a business deal, I'm not gonna wake up to attend it. There is a possibility that I may gain a million Kuwaiti dinar, but because Allah predestined everything, so probably I will lose. True. And probably you will win. Likewise, why do you eat the food in front of you if everything is predestined? If Allah wants you to be full, you will, you will be full without eating. This is insane. Allah Azza wa Jal has created this universe and he has put rules and regulations that everything should go through. The sun comes from the east every day and it sets in the west every day. Nothing changes until the day of judgment when the sun rises from the west. Likewise, Allah says, eat or you'll die of starvation. In order to eat, you have to go and cook. And in order to cook, you have to work and uh, earn money. You may succeed in earning, you may not. This is not your problem. Your problem is to do what you're told. So predestiny, everything that is happening is in Allah's hands. Now you don't know what Allah has written for you and this is why you'll be held accountable for whatever you do. But believe me, if you do your level best and you trust Allah and you believe in predestiny as part of the six articles of faith, you will be in safe hands. Those who are doubtful, those who are dubious or, or thinking bad about Allah Azza wa Jal all the time, they will end up in hell because they do not believe in the qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. And at the end of the day, between you and me, huh? don't share it with people. At the end of the day, who owns you? Allah. Who possesses everything in this universe? Allah. Who has control over everything in this universe? Allah. If Allah would take the whole universe, with the angels, with everybody, with the prophets, with the humans, with everybody in this universe and toss them in hellfire. Can anyone object? Can anyone do anything about it? No. But we believe that Allah is fair. Allah is just. Allah is kind. Allah is wise. And he would never ever do this. So trust Allah Azza wa Jal. Have faith in him and at the same time do your due diligence in this life, do your best, and your best would become fruitful on the day of judgment, bi'idhnillahi azza wa jal. Aisha says, 
is earning money through online surveys, halal or haram. I don't know how this works, but if there are uh, companies that recruit me and say, listen, Sheikh, we have 10 websites that we'd like you to survey and to give an assessment or to participate in a survey. Now, if this is a legitimate thing, meaning that they're asking me about the uh, uh, benefits of this pen, whether it's good, economic, effective, etc., and I give my sincere opinion, and they give me money for that, this is halal. But if they tell me just to participate, to put my name, so that they add the number of participants in the survey, or they ask me to lie, or I do lie without them asking me, because I don't know the product, but I'm just putting my uh, uh, name and initials in yes and no, this is haram money uh, indeed. Owais, and this is the third and last question from the email, what does maintaining ties of kinship mean? How often must we meet our kins? And what if they all live in different countries and cities? Is text messaging considered as maintaining ties? First of all, kinship is your relationship from your father and mother's side. So the relatives of your wife or your in-laws are not your kinship. Second of all, there is no specific time limit to connect to your kinship in Islam. So in, never you will find it, it telling you uh, one week is okay, two is okay, four weeks is a lot. Now you're severing your kinship. And there is no form of way, whether it's a text message or a phone call or an email or a normal uh, postage letter or face-to-face -face meeting. So this is all considered part of what al-urf dictates, what is the norm in the community, in your society, in your tribe, in your family. So sometimes I call my cousins like once every couple of weeks. And they're okay with that. Actually, they don't call me usually. I'm the one who initiates the call. And that's fine because as long as our hearts are pure and we have nothing, no grudges, not, no hard feelings, it's not uh, uh, um, touche. I call you, you call me. No, it is something you do for the sake of Allah. They have a lot of engagements and I'm a free person. I don't have as much... Uh, um, work-related uh, material to stop me from calling. So I call them every couple of weeks, maybe 10 days, sometimes every week. And I call my relatives like this. Sometimes I get involved a lot and I forget. So I call them once every month and they're fine with that. And some of them, even if I don't call them the whole year, and we meet only for Eid, they are totally fine with that. And some of them, if you don't call them for entire yani life, your entire life, they're fine with that. They don't actually care whether you call or not. They think that this is a materialistic thing. One of my cousins, I used to call every week. And once he called me, he said, listen, awesome. If you're calling me, and this is exactly what he said, <laughs> Wallahi. And the guy prays, the guy is a Muslim, but westernized. He said, if you're calling me to score a point with your Lord, don't call me. But if you're calling me because I'm your cousin, then yes, you, you have no problem in that. And this is how th some people think. May Allah help us, Azza wa Jal. So, there isn't anything specific in the Sharia. You can do that, you can uh, call them according to what is the norm. However, if someone is in need financially and you're able, you should help. If someone is in need of physical help to carry things or move out physically and you can do that, you should do that. If you know someone that would help, you introduce him to that person. If they would require you assisting or at least coming to their weddings or their funerals, then you should be there physically, and inshallah, this yani, uh, um, answers your question. Finally, I think it's finally, I don't know, number two or number three? Uh, yeah, number three, 
What does maintaining, okay, that was number three, I'm getting old. Okay, so now we take the questions from your calls. Abdullah from Canada. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I have one question, and that question is, why does it seem that authentic hadiths contradict each other? For example, there are many authentic hadiths that the Ummah will be divided into 73 sects, but there is an authentic hadith in Sunan Ibn Majah that the Ummah will be divided into 72. Why is this? Okay. Um, Tanbir from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Sheikh, I have a question regarding Kulua. There is a sister asked me, she is from Bangladesh, if you know the rickshaws in Bangladesh, uh, she said that she goes to college. So uh, can she go alone with the rickshaw driver uh, in the college? Will it be a khulua? Is it permissible or not? Okay. I will answer you, inshallah. Um, we have Muhammad from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, I want to find out uh, you send um, some money home for family maintenance and maybe the year will turn around to meet some of it in the bank. Is it zakatable and how will we be able to take the zakat? Can, can you repeat that? The money you have sent already to your family or it's with you in your bank account? Yes, for family maintenance. Okay, where is the money? Who has the money? Who possesses it? It is with the, uh, with the wife right now. Okay, and, and this is only for groceries, etc. Yes, for family, keeping the house and those sort of things. Okay, I will answer, inshallah. Mahdi from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. How are you? I'm fine. Wa alaikum salam. Tullah, hayyakallah, akhi Mahdi. Okay, Sheikh, my question is that, uh, alhamdulillah, I'm 17 years old and I don't have a driving license or a learner's permit. So can I drive a car on public roads for the sake of learning and practicing uh, driving? Jazakallah, Kashik. Okay, Ujazak. And we have Maisha from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. So my question is, there is a big problem nowadays. There is many people are claiming Al Qaeda as Mujahideen, so they accept that ISIS are terrorists. They also do succeed to all the Muslim rulers, as there is no such country where the Sharia law completely applies. So, make them understand about this. And okay, I will answer you, Inshallah. Um, we have Nafia from India. Nafia. Nafia from India. Okay, Fatima from, I don't know where. Fatima? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, my question was that I've been making a lot of promises to myself. I've once, unfortunately, I mean, I've even sweared by the Quran, but I've been breaking my promises like unwanted, but I ask for forgiveness, alhamdulillah, but I still do like want to know what to do more. Like they say you have to fast, but I don't understand what should I do more than that. Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. And we have, okay, Fatima is from Afghanistan. Uh, okay, we, I think we will answer these questions until another patch of uh, callers uh, are there. Abdullah from Canada says, why do some hadiths contradict? Some hadiths say that the ummah would be divided into 72 sects. The other one says the ummah would, divide it, would be divided to 73 uh, sects. First of all, do you believe that the hadiths are from Allah Azza wa Jal and they are a revelation? The answer is yes. This is crystal clear in the Quran where Allah says, whatever the Prophet, the Messenger وسلم, brings to you, you have to accept, and whatever he tells you not to do, you have to refrain. 
And this is only from the hadith. The Quran is there. And Allah Azza wa always says, wa Allah wa Rasul. Always obey Allah and obey the Prophet What does that mean? It means that Allah Azza wa has preserved this deen through the Quran and through the prophetic hadith. So, <coughs> excuse me. If you believe in that, you have to accept that the hadith is preserved from Allah. Number two. Whenever there is a conflict, there are a number of processes that scholars follow. And it's important that you refer to scholars because laymen who do not understand Arabic, who do not understand usul al-fiqh, who do not understand the sciences of hadith, mustalah al-hadith, and, and how to differentiate between da'if and sahih. They would shoot from the hip and they would put themselves in doubtful things and it may lead them to reject the Islam altogether because with this concept of yours, you can even go to the Quran and see that the Quran speaks about a day that is equivalent to a thousand days, a thousand years, and a day that is equivalent to a 50,000 years and a day that is our normal day. So anyone with improper iman and submission to Allah and adequate knowledge would be tested with such information that he could not digest and would lead him to leave Islam, probably. May Allah protect you and all of our viewers. Thirdly, you have to go and search what the ulama said in this. Now, I did not do this research. I know the hadith of the 73, which talks about the whole entire ummah. 72 are in hell and one in, is in paradise. And the hadith is authentic. Now, having said that, maybe the hadith that talks about the 72 is talking about the 72 that are in hell. Not mentioning the one that is in paradise because this is known by default. And the other hadith that talks about 73, the prophet says afterwards, all in hell except one. So you cannot think that verses contradict other verses or verses contradict the hadith because the contradiction is only in your mind. As a Muslim, we believe that this is all from Allah Azza wa Jal. So it is either the contradiction does not exist. Allah Azza wa Jal says, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةُ وَالدَّمْ Dead meat and blood and swine meat is haram. Isn't the Quran in number of ayahs? Yet the Prophet said, alayhi salam, أُحِلَّتْ لَنَا مَيْتَتَانِ وَدَمَانِ Two dead meat and two blood were made permissible for us. Allah says it's prohibited. The Prophet says it's permissible. This is general and this is specific. Am wa khas. If you did not study usul al-fiqh, you will not understand this. But everything that is dead meat is haram with the exception of the locust and the fish. And if you cannot combine between the two so conflicting um, uh, evidences, you go to level two, which is which one is abrogating the other. So one abrogates the other. Like in the three verses of the Quran talking about intoxicants, that they ask you about intoxicants and gambling. Say there is some benefit and there's a lot of harm and the harm is more than outweighs the benefits. Okay, stage one. Stage two, do not approach Salat when you are intoxicated until you recognize what you can recite, okay? Stage three, abrogated both two verses. Stay away from it. And this is decisive. So if you don't understand abrogation and the concept of it, you'd say, oh, three verses that are conflicting, contradicting, the Quran is this and that. And this is all in your mind. If you're unable to know which one came first so that you know which one abrogated which, then you have to 
start to outweigh which one is more authentic. So Quran is always more authentic than the Hadith. If there's any conflict, conflict, then we take the Quran. If the Hadith is in Bukhari and the other one is in Tirmidhi, Bukhari always outweighs, etc. And this is for scholars, not for any Tom, Dick or Harry. Finally, the fourth stage, if all these three cannot be implemented, the fourth stage is I refrain from, uh, uh, an abs I abstain, I just hold on. I don't have any say. I don't know, but definitely there are other scholars who know the answer. So I don't give a verdict of conflicting or contradicting. Rather, I go in search with other scholars until I find the right answer. And I hope this answers your question. We have a short break. Stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said that a man came to the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, O Messenger of Allah, poverty has struck me. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a messenger to one of his wives to bring something for that man to eat. But she said, by the one who sent you with the truth, I only have water. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent to another one of his wives to bring something for the man to eat. But she said the same, until all of them said the same thing. Then Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Who will take this one as a guest in exchange for Allah's mercy? A man from the Ansar said, I will, O messenger of Allah. So he took the man to his home and said to his wife, Treat the guest of the Messenger of Allah well. She said, By Allah, we have nothing except the meal for my children. He said, Get the food ready and light the lamp and put your children to sleep. If they ask for dinner, then when the guest enters, dim the lamp and make it seem as if we are eating. And when he reaches for the food to eat, then stand up to the lantern and turn it off. She got the food ready, turned the lamp on and put the children to sleep. She then went to the lamp as if she was fixing it and turned it off. Then they pretended as they were eating and they both went to sleep hungry. In the morning, the man from the Ansar went to Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who said, Allah has laughed, implying his acceptance to the deed from your actions last night. Then Allah revealed his saying, which means, and they give them preference over themselves, even though they were in need of that. Reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Um, Tansir or t whatever from India uh, says a girl goes out of her home to college with a driver. Is this considered to be a prohibited seclusion? The answer is yes. If both of them are in the car, this is seclusion. Nobody hears what they're talking about or what he's saying to her. And being in such a place fits like a glove, what the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam. مَا خَلَى رَجُلٌ بِمْرَأَةٍ إِلَّا كَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ ثَالِثَهُمَا That no man would be alone with a woman except the third person with them is Satan. And we know what Satan is capable of doing. Muhammad from Saudi Arabia, he says that I send money to my wife overseas so that this is what is considered to be an allowance. They, she buys food for the kids, pays the rent, uh, clothes, medical, um, uh, medicines, etc. So is this zakatable? The answer is, who possesses the money, Muhammad? You or your wife? 
And you will say, no, definitely it's mine. It's not a gift to my wife. The money is mine. She cannot take half of the money that I send and give it uh, uh, to her mother, for example, even if she's needing, without going back to me because this is an allowance to be spent with my approval on the house. It's not a gift. If it's your money and a whole year passes, then you have to give zakat on it because it's still in your possession. You can always say to her, send me back the money or pay this uh, money to this person or this area or this institution. And hence, when you give out your money, your zakat, let's assume it is the first of Jamad al-Ula of this month, the first date, you have to calculate whatever you have zakatable and add to that some what she has, which is negligible. It's not going to be yani, a fortune. So you shouldn't be worried about paying zakat because this is a form of gaining more and more blessings from Allah Azza wa through that and Allah knows best. Mahdi from Bangladesh says he doesn't have a driving license. So is it permissible for him to drive on the road to learn? The answer if it's this, if this is safe. And usually, most countries allow someone without a, driving, a driver's license to drive if he's accompanied by someone with a, driving, a driver's license so that he would supervise. So if this is the case, yeah, there's no problem, inshallah, providing that you don't endanger yourself or other drivers, uh, uh, Misha from Bangladesh, she says that there are people who claim that Al-Qaeda and the ISIS, the non-Islamic state of Israel, of, uh, Israel, of Iraq and, and Syria, they are Mujahideen. So what to do and what to talk about? They are not Mujahideen. Come on. They are terrorists. And the impact of what they had done, how they changed the whole world, how they intimidated everybody, including the Muslims. It's not focused on the non-Muslims. Even the Muslims were negatively impacted by their actions and their missions. Muslims have died. Sectarian violence has increased. They have no legitimacy. They have no Islamic flag. They have no Muslim ruler backing them up. So they are rebels, renegades, or in the Islamic terminology, they are khawarij. They kill the innocent and leave the culprits. They focus their attacks on the Muslims and accuse the Muslims of being kuffar, disbelievers. While the enemies of Islam are in safe hands, nobody is touching them. And they have nothing related to Islam. All what they have done tarnished the reputation of Islam worldwide. And this is what serves the targets and the plans and the strategy of the enemies, the true enemies of Islam. Therefore, anyone claiming that they are Mujahideen, such people are ignorant in Islam, have zero knowledge in Islam. They are people who are thinking with hate and wanting destruction, not knowing how to channel such emotions according to the Quran and the Sunnah. Because this is not the way of the Prophet ﷺ. This is not the way of the companions. So which religion are you following? Discriminately killing innocent people, blowing up places, hijacking airplanes or doing whatever terrorist attacks you want to do. Now, we have to admit that not everything attributed to them is true. But they are a terrorist or they are both terrorist organizations. But the enemies of Islam again and the intelligence agencies add a lot of spices that serves their agenda. So if there is a, an earthquake, ah, oh, this is this terrorist organization or that. And this means that because they caused this earthquake, we should rampage their masjids and Islamic centers and ban the niqab 
and anyone with beard, we put them in jail and, and make a cross check on them. Ah, so it's not terror that you are fighting, it is Islam. And this is what we see in Europe cle clearly, that is happening. But this doesn't mean that we endorse what these terrorist groups are doing. No, we condemn them. Every Muslim uh, 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 condemns them, but at the same time, we are not stupid. We know that these countries make a lot of plotting and strategizing to incriminate these people and lead them to do such things and hence tarnish the reputation of Islam. We know that these countries prohibit the spread of true Islam, true knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah, true scholars coming to teach so that they would promote violence and they would eradicate true Islam and following the Sunnah. And this is what happens even in some Muslim countries. So go back to the real scholars, go back to the Quran and the Sunnah, follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ, and you will be in good hands, inshallah. Fatima from Afghanistan, she says she made a number of promises in the past and, <clears throat> and um, uh, she broke them. Sometimes she made a promise on the Quran and we spoke about that earlier, so I'm not gonna repeat it again, the ruling on making a promise on the Quran or an oath on the Quran. So she says, what to do now? Some people say I have to expiate. First of all, if you promised yourself, like I'm not gonna smoke, there is nothing on you because you did not use the word of Allah. If you said, in your head, wallahi, I will not smoke. Then there is nothing on you because you did not utter it, you did not say it. If you verbally said, oh Allah, I promise you, or oh Allah, well, I will, by your name, I will never smoke again. This is an oath that was said verbally and hence you have to expiate it if you were to break it. And the expiation is to feed or to clothe 10 poor people or to free a slave. You have the choice, one of these three. If you cannot financially do any of them, then you must fast three days for every oath that you have taken by Allah's name and said it verbally. Now, if you took an oath not to smoke and you smoked, and took another oath not to smoke and you smoked, and took a 10 or th th a thousand uh, other oaths and you broke them all, you need one expiation. But if they are different things, not, uh, uh, not to smoke, not to listen to music, not to watch movies, not to miss a salat, these are different, so each one needs an expiation, and Allah Azza wa knows best. Leiden from Macedonia. Sheikh. Yes, sir. Uh, I put Najis I clothes in my washing machine, and when I opened the washing machine, there was still water not drained. I think my clothes didn't wash well. Then I put them in my drying machine, and after that, uh, I washed other clothes in the drying machine. I dried them. So did a lot of things in my house become magist because I did this? Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Um, Buba from Gambia. Buba. Buba from Gambia. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam, wa barakatuh. I have two questions, say. Uh, the first question one, is... One question only, Buba. Only one, please. Oh, okay. Um, um, the first question is regarding um, tahajjud. Is it rec recommended to recite um, loud or in silence? Okay, I will answer, inshallah. Sayyid from Afghanistan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, respected Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, hayyak Allah akhi. Respected Sheikh, I had, a, I had one question. Uh, my question is, uh, there's a company, uh, it's not, I don't know if it's uh, governmental or uh, it's private, but uh, they, uh, when you want to buy a house in, a, in some country, this company provides you uh, the property, they buy the property, but they don't give you the exact money to you. 
but when they buy the uh, the home which you have selected for you, uh, they allow you to pay them the the company that has bought the house. Uh, they tell you to pay them a monthly on monthly basis some amount of money. By the end, when the amount uh, with which the property was bought is uh, uh, has uh, come to an end, they ask you for three uh, percent percentage of money of their service uh, works. Is it uh, is it a riba or is it not? Is it allowed to uh, allowed for us to buy it uh, in that way or not? Okay, I will answer inshallah. And uh, Tanzima from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Shaykh. Wa uh, Shaykh, my question is, uh, I know that if someone uh, does wudu and wears the sock, then he can wipe over, over the sock for next 24 hours. But if the wudu breaks for some reason while wearing the sock, does it need to be renewed immediately or can it be delayed? Okay, can I ask you a question, uh, Tanzima? You said... You know that if someone makes wudu and wears the socks, he can wipe on it for 24 hours. Why yes. would he wipe on it? Wipe over the sock. Why? During wudu. For renewing wudu. Okay, so if he breaks his wudu, then he would wipe on it. Correct? All right. So what, where is your question? My question is if the wudu breaks for some reason while wearing the sock, does it need to be renewed immediately to keep on the sock? Or does it, can it be delayed? Okay, I will answer you. Uh, Nafi'a, okay, we have um, Muhammad from Nigeria. Muhammad? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Alaikum salam, hayakallah, Muhammad. Now, I have a question. Yes. Um, uh, you know, uh, in your prayer, you normally say the askar, like uh, Subhanallah, Rabbi Al-Allah, uh, Subhanallah, Rabbi Al-Azim, for Ruku, uh, Subhanallah, Rabbi Al-Allah, for uh, Sujud. Um, the question now is, you know there are other uh, supplications uh, that one can recite, like when you are saying your prayers, can you, after reciting the Subhanallah, Rabbi Al-Allah, three times, add other supplications, uh, also say your dua, is it permissible? Okay. I will answer, inshallah. Uh, Nafi'a from India. <coughs> Nafi'a. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as I can barely hear you. My question is regarding when incontinence. Hello? Yes. Alhamdulillah, I know the two ruling where if a person knows for sure that there is a time when gas would stop, he must pray at that time. And the other, where if a person continuously passes gas every minute, he can make wudu once, the, once after the adhan is called. But what if a person doesn't know when the gas will stop? There is no particular period that gas stops. It may stop or it may not. Mostly it doesn't stop. What is the ruling that person should apply? Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Ayman from Germany. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. How are you, Sheikh? I'm doing well. Zakallah khair. Um, I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, there are certain softwares or apps on the App Store or on, on the PC that cost money, okay? So um, there are certain people who, who get the um, apps for free um, and they sell it to other people for free. Um, an example for this is Adobe Photoshop. Um, um, it obviously costs money and they sell it for free. So I, my question is, is it permissible to... Um, get them, get it for free, um, despite um, they cost money. Okay, I will answer you, inshallah. Jazakallah Lidon from Macedonia, he says that if he puts impure clothes in the washing machine and it works and then it, he comes at the end and he takes the clothes and he finds that there is still water in it, yet he puts it in the dryer with other clothes, so he's asking now, is all of these clothes are impure, najis, or not? First of all, this issue of OCD, a lot of the Muslims have it. And I've, as I've stated this over and over again, like 75% of the calls I get in my counseling sessions are on OCD. And... What, the more you do it, you become experienced. Not that it's rocket science. 
It's simple knowledge of Islam. But the people don't know. Who throws these thoughts in your mind? Shaitan, no doubt. Either you are so keen on religion or you are so loose and let go, neglectful. If you're neglectful, you don't care about prayer, you don't care about impurity, you don't care about halal food, uh, uh, liquor, etc., free mixing, he has no problem. He adds in focusing sins and desires until you leave the fold of Islam. If you're inclined to religion and fear Allah Azza wa Jal and love the Quran, the Prophet Islam, he intimidates you, he depresses you, he throws so many things your way that would you make you go to extreme. So is this halal, haram? Is this tahur? Maybe the pen was touched by someone who had feces in his hand. I saw a guy come out of the, uh, the toilet. I don't know if he washed his hand or not and he delivered to me this mug. I don't know if the... Okay, how to, fa uh, to counter this? There are a number of rules. Number one, very easy, but you need someone to walk you and to clarify you. This is my job in counseling sessions. I don't, I'm not a shrink, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm an eye opener. Those who talk to me are confused. The minute I tell them this, what I'm telling you now, they said, ah, oh, I didn't know that. Everything in this room, in this world is pure, unless proven otherwise. So this is a legal maxim. Certainty is not affected by doubt. Hmm, is this pure or not? Maybe one of my grandchildren peed on it. Maybe there's a drop of urine. Should I go smell it? This is not logical. So many people talk to me and said, maybe there is a drop of urine, Sheikh. How do you know? I said, yeah, maybe you were born out of wedlock and your mother did not marry your father until she conceived you. Their boyfriend, girlfriend, said, Sheikh, you've offended me. <laughs> yeah, this is why I, what I intended. This is what I do. It's a shock therapy. He said, no, my father married my mother. I was born legitimately. He said, okay, you have witnesses, you have marriage contract. You have... So no one can say this unless they provide you with evidence. Likewise, this is pure until proven otherwise. Certainty, which is purity, is not affected by doubt, which is something that comes to your mind. Okay, Sheikh, you make a long story short. My trousers had najasa on them. So I put them in the washing machine. Okay, what does the washing machine do? It fills it up with water, it mixes it all up, it drains it. Then it fills it up again and it drains it and this is over. True? I said, yes. I said, okay, when you opened the washing machine, there was water in it. I said, yes. Yeah, but the first trends took the water. So now your trouser is clean, unless proven otherwise, because it was washed, it was overwhelmed with water. Do you see any najasa physically? No, but it might be, Akhi, don't talk to me, it might be or might not be. Is there anything physically that you can see or smell or taste? I don't advise you tasting it though. He said, no, then the default it is pure, the rest is pure, and I hope this uh, fixes it. Uh, Murad, I apologize, from Holland. Yes. Yes, what can I do for you? Yes, I uh, have a question. I uh, I hear voices in my head, and uh, I don't know if Satan is or not, but uh, I have schizophrenia, schizophrenia. I don't know what to do, and uh, I'm scared to go outside, but people hate me and so all this. I don't know. Okay, I will answer you, uh, Murad, inshallah. Buba from Gambia says, Tahajjud, should we say it loud or silently? You should say it in between. There is a narration that Abu Bakr used to recite silently and Umar used to recite loudly. May Allah be pleased with them. So the Prophet ﷺ to Abu Bakr, raise your voice a little bit and said to Umar who was reading it loudly, make it a little bit uh, uh, lower. So you should do it in between. If you 
recite so that you can hear it. So you say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. You don't have to announce it to the whole house. That would be sufficient, inshallah. Say it from Afghanistan. Says, a company buys a house for you. Akhi, there's no company that buys a house for you for the sake of Allah. So I have this tablet and I don't have the money to uh, uh, buy it off. What to do? I go to a company and the company says, yeah, I've got a lot of cash. So uh, uh, how much does it cost? It's $1,000. Okay, we'll buy it for you and you'll pay us on installments for 10 months, $100 a month. And at the end, you should give us $30 as our commission. This is clearly interest-based uh, transaction in Sriba. Now, if I buy this from the owner and the owner says it's $1,000 cash, but if you want to buy it through installments, I can give it to you for uh, $1,100, not a penny more. So, okay, this is halal. Because this increase is from the same owner. He has the right to sell it for a thousand, for eleven hundred, or even for five hundred when it's uh, uh, um, the seasons of holidays and he wants to make a discount or wants to get rid of it. No problem. A third party who's not interested in the tablet, rather, he's interested in lending me money with interest. This is Riba and Allah knows best. Tanzima from Bangladesh, she says, if I wear my socks after performing wudu and I break my wudu, do I have to immediately make wudu and wipe on my socks? The answer is no. You don't need to. This is why whenever I break my wudu normally without wearing socks, I don't have to perform wudu. I can wait until the time of the next prayer, two hours, three hours later, and when I want to pray, I perform wudu and I wash my feet. Likewise, when you're wearing your socks on your feet, after two, three hours, if you want to pray, you perform wudu and you wipe on your feet. And this is for 24 hours. Muhammad from Nigeria says, can I, after saying Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la in sujood three times, make my own dua? The answer is yes. Nafi'a says, I don't know when the uh, um, passing of wind would stop or my urine incontinence. So, if I don't know, should I wait until the end of time or not? If this is something that happens frequently and you may notice that it stops and you may not notice that it stops and it leads to a lot of hardship, in this case, you can perform wudu after the adhan and pray because you are not a normal person and you take the ruling of the ma'dhur and Allah knows best. Ayman from Germany says, can I get hacked apps or software for free? The answer is no. This is copyrighted. And those who hacked it or broke the code and giving it you, to you for free are actually breaking the law and trespassing on other people's rights. And this is haram. Now, if this is something for personal use and you need it but you don't have the money to do to 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 buy it and it's not for commercial use and it's found for free you didn't steal you didn't hack you didn't break any laws then i believe that if it's for personal use you can do that i wouldn't personally do it because the, the room of disobeying allah is greater than the room of being it uh, permissible and anything that is dubious you have to stay away from. Murad from Holland, <clears throat> again, may Allah cure him and help him. He hears voices in his head and he is depressed and he thinks that people hate him. All of these, Akhi, are OCD-ish. They are from your obsessive compulsive disorder. Each one of us has voices in, in their heads. And we were told by the Prophet ﷺ that there is an angel and there is a devil who is whispering in our ears. The whispering of the angel is to promise you of goodness and convince you of believing in truth. And the whispering of shaitan is to promise you of evil and poverty and to make you disbelieve in the truth. 
So now, Akhi, you have to draw the line. Nobody can help you except you seeking help from Allah Azza wa Jal. When you get these voices, ask, stop them and say, excuse me, who's talking to me? If I get voices in my head now telling to me, Asim, why don't you after this program ends, drive one hour to Mecca and pray Maghrib and Isha there, maybe do Umrah if you get the permission and come back and it's only two, three, three or four hours and you're home to have dinner with your kids. So I say, excuse me, who's, who's talking to me? What would the answer be? Angel or a devil? Definitely an angel. Because the angel is encouraging me to do something that is useful and halal. While if I get the voices saying, wow, why don't you go and watch a movie or listen to music or there's a party somewhere, let's go and have fun. Say, hey, wait, wait, wait. Who's this? Ah, uh, it's Lucifer. It's the devil. It's Satan. So Allah Azza wa has given you the knowledge to differentiate. This is hot or cold. If I'm going to eat this, it's going to hurt me or it's going to benefit me. Likewise in religion. Whenever you see that there is hardship in religion, the voices are depressing you, are overwhelming you, you should know that this is from shaitan. And this is why there are counseling sessions. This is why there are Muslims, uh, uh, psychiatrists in, in Holland, inshallah, there are many, if you look for them, that could help you and sit with you and talk you out of this. Because all of this is from shaitan. The only objective of shaitan is to mess with your mind and to throw you in hell. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect you and save you. This is all the time we have until we meet next Saturday. I leave you for Iman Allah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين